Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me get this into presentation mode. I'm beginning. There we go. <coughs> so this class is called with steel, flame and honey with a question mark. Um, it's we're going to talk about treating the wounded in late medieval Europe. I am Etienne de Montague. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a master of defense in Ansteora. A um, couple of disclaimers that I always throw in at the beginning of this class. I am not a medical professional. I'm an enthusiastic researcher. Um, don't attempt any of the procedures described in this class. Uh, this class is also not a practical demonstration. I'm not going to be showing you surgical techniques or medical techniques. Um, it's what I refer to as a picture flipping exercise. We oftentimes have specific mental pictures of the way things worked in the Middle Ages that aren't necessarily correct. And I, I love classes that allow me to kind of flip that picture a bit and um, show us some, at least a different view of things. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about wound care, specifically from about the 14th century and largely focusing on the 14th century. Um, so first off, what do we tend to believe about medieval medicine? Most of us have some preconceptions. Um, the media gives them to us. Uh, just standard communicated oral history tells us things. Um, and when I was first putting this class together, I just kind of surveyed some of my friends and got a list of some of the more common uh, beliefs that Medieval medicine was unsophisticated, unhygienic, and brutal. Um, there was a lot of superstition and luck involved. Uh, it was based oftentimes on ancient theory, reading texts and simply following those texts rather than actually following any sort of observable scientific method. Um, that humors and astrology were more important than practical knowledge. Bleeding, that came up a whole lot and bleeding the patient dry and that a big one that we oftentimes get is that medical learning was suppressed by the church so that surgeons were little more than untrained butchers. And yes, there were certainly untrained individuals out there. There's no doubt about that. Um, but there were also quite a number of sophisticated surgeons. There was medicine was actually quite sophisticated for its time. One of the things that I want to kind of drive home when I'm talking about this is we will be discussing at least a little bit the Galenic theory of medicine, which is humors and that sort of thing. The important thing about the Galenic method is that while we know now it was not correct, it was internally consistent. It was built on its own logic. It was built on observation and it was very much the science of the day. Um, <laughs> so, Let's meet a really interesting fellow here. Um, this is, let's talk about Guy de Chauliac. Guy was a French surgeon um, born around 1300 in Southern France. Uh, he was educated uh, in Toulouse and also at the University of Montpellier. He then went to Italy and studied dissection Another misconception we oftentimes get um, <clears throat> with uh, medieval medicine is that their sense of anatomy was poor. Whoops, sorry about that. Their sense of anatomy was poor. They were forbidden to dissect bodies. Um, <clears throat> this was uh, not the case. I'll talk about that just a little bit on this, but I want to get through, through Guy here. Uh, Guy served as physician to three Avignon's popes, so he was very well regarded. He was qualified as a physician, not as a surgeon, though he practiced surgery. Um, in the Middle Ages, there was a distinction between a physician and a surgeon. A physician was primarily a di uh, did diagnosis and mixed medicines and that sort of thing. A surgeon did the physical treatment and healing, but Guy was definitely a surgeon, as we're going to see. Um, he survived the Black Death. He writes about actually contracting it and living through it. And he wrote the book Chirurgia Magna, the major surgery in 1363. So the Chirurgia Magna, uh, 
is, this is my English translation of it, and you can see it is not a small book. Um, the English translation has a lot of footnotes and everything else, but it is still almost 700 pages. <laughs> he wrote it in Latin in 1363, and it circulated in manuscript form uh, for over the next century. And if you think about it, a book of this magnitude, copying it by hand and circulating it, that's a massive undertaking, which gives you an idea of how well regarded it was. It was finally printed in 1473, once the printing press came into, into use. There are over 70 editions of it out there from our period, including translations into French, Provençal, which is a uh, Southern French uh, language, Dutch, Catalan, which is a, a Spanish dialect, English and Hebrew. The uh, book is divided into seven treatises, which are devoted to anatomy, swellings, wounds, ulcers, fractures, and, and then special diseases and antidotes. There's a lot of discussion of mixing medicines and that sort of thing in there. Each treatise um, <clears throat> is in two parts. The first is a general doctrine and then chapters after that focusing on particular sites or body regions. And <clears throat> it's largely based on the works of Hippocrates and Galen, those two classics, but it incorporates work from Egyptian, Persian, and Arabian physicians from the 11th to 13th centuries. It's important to note that once the Crusades got underway, there was a tremendous amount of knowledge flowing back and forth from the Middle East into Europe a whole lot of medical knowledge came through there. A lot of the best translations of Hippocrates and Galen were actually translated into Arabic or Persian and then transmitted um, later on during the Crusades. A lot of the medicine that made its way to the, to the West is what uh, we refer to as Islamist. And by Islamist, I mean, these are someone who was very possibly of European descent and Christian uh, faith, but they lived in a primarily Islamic country and were educated there. So we have a lot of works like that. Um, this book here, which I recommend highly um, because it's affordable, it's cheap, um, and it's a great uh, to sit down and open it up and read it anywhere. It's a uh, Medicine and Healing in the Pre-Modern West by uh, Winston Black. It's just a series of translations of medical texts throughout our period. Um, and it's, it's really well done. It gives a really great sense of the um, evolution of medicine. Uh, the to get back to uh, de Choliac, the Corregia Magna references or has 3,200 references to the works of other physicians. This tells me that Guy de Choliac was an incredibly well-read, um, well-educated man writing about surgery who knew his stuff. And in this, he incorporated those past works with practical observation, clinical experience, and critical thinking. This is a translated quote from him that I love, where he's talking about the value of, pra of actual hands-on practice. And he says, they have to my mind understood very badly Aristotle's second book of metaphysics, where he shows that these two things, fear and love, are the obstacles on the road to knowledge of the truth. Let them give up such friendships or fears, because while Socrates or Plato may be a friend, truth is a greater friend. Let them follow the Ga doctrine of Galen, which is entirely made up of experience and reason, and in which one investigates things and despises words. So in that, he's saying it's more important to trust the evidence of your eyes, to trust what you have learned from a practical standpoint than to fall back on theory. <laughs> so we know the Corregia Magna was widely translated, widely published. In fact, it remains part of the French medical canon all the way up into the 19th century. They're still teaching parts of it in France in the 1800s. Um, and this is the surgery that de Choliac is describing. Um, and it is very different than what you might think. Um, it includes things such as inhalational anesthesia. You know, one of our great myths, uh, or our great 
beliefs about medieval surgery is it was brutal and painful and that maybe you could give a patient enough wine or beer to knock him out. Well, in the 13th century in Salerno, which was one of the great medical centers of, of that century, they developed a method where they would take um, the juice of poppies, soak sponges in the poppy juice, dry it out, and then if you had a patient you needed to knock out, you poured boiling water over the sponge and had them inhale the fumes of the poppy juice and it would knock them out. Now, I'm not going to say it's as exact as modern anesthesia by any means. I'm sure there were some very unfortunate side effects there, but they, they had it. And that's something that I think we lose. You know, it's, it's one of those interesting little facts we lose along the way. Um, antiseptic surgery. They didn't have a germ theory of disease. They didn't understand that. They didn't understand microbes. What surgeons knew though, and document, and De Choliac documents that, was that if you keep your tools clean, if you keep, uh, if you use clean linens, if you wash your tools in vinegar or wine, you have better outcomes. And that's where I think it's important that we're talking about the fact that this is practice-based, this is practical. They understood how to treat infection. They understood that you had to remove foreign bodies in order to heal, to heal wounds. De Choliac describes how to do hernia repair and cataract treatment. In fact, cataracts were one of his specialties. And if you think about it, the fact that he was the, the physician to popes and how important reading was to the clerical life in the Middle Ages, it makes sense that preserving eyesight was important. And someone said, well, how do you, rep how do you repair an eye in period? Well, he used silver wire as a suture. I'm sure it was incredibly painful and uncomfortable for his patients, but it worked and he documents it. He developed methods of suspension and traction for femoral fractures that the English medical canon thought they invented in the seventh or in the 18th century, which I think is you know, typical, typical Anglo-centric um, point of view, but it's documented in De Choliac, um, these methods <coughs> for hand, handling femoral fractures and treatment to wounds to all parts of the body. Um, this picture here, just want to point out there, it's a uh, dissection going underway. This is actually a picture from um, depicting a the medical school at Salerno and they're dissecting a body. Um, unlike what you oftentimes we'll hear in the popular view, dissection wasn't suppressed, but it also wasn't particularly common because it wasn't particularly necessary. One of the things that we lose track of living in this modern world where everything is very hygienic and we don't have to think too much about where our food came, came from is that everyone in the Middle Ages knew what the insides of dead things looked like. All you had to do was walk, walk through a market stall and you would see animals being butchered right in front of you. Um, and it doesn't take a lot of brains to figure out, particularly if you're going to be a surgeon or a doctor, that the insides of a pig and the insides of a person are largely the same. So dissection was less a piece of medical training because it was largely viewed to be unnecessary, but it was allowed, it was sanctioned by the church, you had to have licenses to do it. Um, but most of the myths we have about the church suppressing science and medicine and all of that, it's really not the Middle Ages. It's not the medieval period. It really happens more after the Reformation, um, particularly when you get into the, the strong strife uh, between Catholic and Protestant and you get into strong anti-Catholicism, you actually see a lot a lot of the suppression of knowledge comes in on the Protestant side because they're suppressing anything that seems Catholic. And most of the really horrible things that get laid on the, on the lap of the medieval period are actually you know, the early modern era, um, but popular culture doesn't make that distinction. So how do we know these things worked? Okay, we've got the accounts of de Choliac and others that attest to the success of surgeries. And we've even got accounts of lives of the famous where people get injured, but these can be exaggerated. You know, we don't have <coughs> firm eyewitness accounts that are trustworthy. So what can we look at to show us that these procedures worked and had value to medieval 
people. This is an important thing to me because it's great to say, well, I've got this big thick book here and it was very popular, but what if it's all garbage? So um, this is an interesting piece I just recently discovered. Um, this is the first time I'm teaching this little tidbit. In 1337, uh, King Philip VI of France um, signed a contract with a Genoese mercenary company. These would be the crossbowmen who were at Cressy. They were actually part of a naval fleet um, commanded by an admiral named Aitan Doria. And there's a blurb in all of the legalese that Aitan must also provide a master surgeon from his country to whom the king, our lord, must give and pay 10 florins of Florence each month that Aitan, his captains, his men, and galleys serve the king. 10 florins a month is roughly 25% more than a knight made in a month. And the fact that it's specifying florins of Florence, there were other countries producing florins at that time. The Florentine florin, however, was gold and was never debased during any time during its existence. So it was a very constant um, set of value. So a doctor was making roughly 20, or a surgeon was making roughly 25% more than a knight in the service of this company. The fact that it's specified in the contract like that tells me that this was a known value. This was important and people knew about it and you know, they valued this service and it was important and, you know, and they worked it into the contract. Um, we also have the archaeological record, um, which is something to look at. This um, right here, this little thing, this is a part of a human femur. Um, <coughs> it was, <ampu> <coughs> or it, it shows signs of amputation. It actually shows signs of traumatic amputation. Uh, this femur was unearthed at Alhubarota, which is a site in Portugal where a massive battle was fought in 1385. And in the 50s, an archaeologist found between four and 5,000 sets of human remains on the site. This particular femur shows that it was traumatically amputated, but it also shows remodeling that shows that it healed, which means the soldier or knight or whatever it came from not only survived the loss of his limb, but recovered and fought again. And that's the interesting thing. We can't look at medieval dead bodies and, and look for you know, soft tissue injuries, obviously. But in the bone record, we can find quite a bit. In 2016, uh, Robert Woosnam Savage of the Royal Armory and Kelly DeVries of Loyola University did a massive study of remains found in medieval burial sites, thousands of remains, looking for signs of battle injuries, of, of battle trauma. Now, bones can only tell us so much, no matter what uh, TV will tell us. But one thing we can see from bones are signs of healing, where someone got injured and recovered. Um, we can also see signs of medical amputation, because medical amputation looks different than traumatic battle amputation. Some of this, we, we can't say for sure, may be due to natural healing. But given the amount of effort it took to produce one of these surgical manuals, I think it's reasonable to conclude that medical knowledge had an impact. Let's look at this fellow here. Um, this, is, this skeleton is referred to as the Hereford Knight. It was found at Hereford Cathedral in 2009. The remains date to the late 12th or early 13th century. This was a tall, well-built adult male. He was about five foot 10. He was approximately 45 years old at the time of his death. According to testing done on his teeth, he was raised in Normandy. So I, those of you who know your English history are probably getting a picture of this guy very quickly, that he's big, he's strong, he's Norman. There's a ch good chance he was likely a knight. He was buried in what's called a half cyst grave uh, with the stones here, which shows a bit more uh, care than just simply dropping him in a hole in the ground. Uh, and his medical history is written all over his bones. He had a badly fractured right shoulder blade that had fully healed by the time of his death and a serious break in his lower left leg that had also healed. It's a twisting fracture. Um, so possibly due to the consequence of having a blow on the right side of his body while on horseback. Uh, 
So one theory, and this is theory I want to stress, is that you know he was perhaps jousting, took a hard shot to the shoulder, which broke the shoulder blade, twisted him out of the saddle, and broke his leg with a twisting fracture when it got caught in the stirrup. Regardless, he recovered from those wounds. <clears throat> that would have taken a long time, but he recovered. Um, there's no fatal blow that osteologists could find on the body, but there are injuries potentially connected to one. During his lifetime, he sustained at least nine rib fractures on two different occasions. Again, this shows signs of a violent life. The second occasion was the bad one as the rib fracture only shows the signs of a few weeks of healing. Um, so it wasn't necessarily a fatal blow, but it's likely the one that got him. Um, interestingly, none of the blows, none of the, the injuries to the bone that they can find show sharp edge, like a deep cut. Um, and that's why they, the theory is that he possibly died due to tourneying injuries, uh, blunted weapons, that sort of thing. Of course, the armor of the time would have absorbed a great deal of edged impacts as well, so it's hard to say. But it's an interesting view of someone who led a violent life, healed, and um, probably died of violence later on. <laughs> All right, let's talk about treating the wounded. Uh, first off, this fellow here, we saw, we saw a variation of him on the cover. Uh, you'll see this oftentimes in pictures of medieval medicine. This is the wound man or the wounded man. Um, and I've had people say, well, what is this for? And it's what we would call a rubric or in uh, modern terms, a crosswalk. It's a handy diagram of all these different injuries and you'll note the notations beside them. That's telling the surgeon where in his manual the treatment for this particular wound is. So it's a very handy guide to look at, oh, I've got someone who's got an arrow wound in the leg. Okay, where do I need to go to, to see how to treat that? So Chirurgia Magna's third treatise is devoted to wounds and wound care. Uh, it begins with the general chapter of theory and practice, his first doctrine, and then eight chapters that are devoted to treating wounds in particular parts of the body. His fifth treatise is devoted to fractures and dislocated joints, which he differentiates from wounds. I don't go into fractures and dislocated joints because they make me really, really super squeamish even to think about. Um, and I do this for fun. So I have not subjected myself to something that I don't consider fun. Um, someday I probably will expand it, but not yet. <laughs> so the first step in, wound, in dealing with wounds is assessing it. Uh, Guy talks a lot about assessing wounds. He notes the sort of wounds that are likely to be lethal and those which are treatable. And he talks quite frankly and honestly about wounds that are likely to kill, the patient is likely not to live, for, live through. Um, he notes occasional anecdotal exceptions, but, he said, but he's very practical in that there's nothing you can do for this person. So a wound that penetrates the stomach is probably lethal. A wound that penetrates the bladder is basically, as far as he was concerned, 100% lethal. Um, <coughs> but like I said, he does talk about the exceptions. Um, he's reasoning from a different understanding of physiological factors. So to him, a wound near the heart is dangerous for a different reason than our modern surgeons would consider a wound near the heart. But the logic is consistent and it's clearly in line with what he sees. And he, you know, and he mentions again, or he mentions studying anatomy, you know, in Bologna. Even when he's noting the lethality, like I said, he notes remarkable cases. There's one where he talks about a head wound, a chair maker in, I think, Ghent suffered, where a bunch of his brains basically got knocked out of his skull. So it was a massive head wound. And he said, but the man recovered, but he could pretty much just sit there and smile at you now. Um, one of the notable things, and I see this in, in Guy and I've seen it in some other manuals, is consent. And we don't think about that necessarily. Getting permission from the patient, from his family, or from church authorities. A lot of this is what we would call CYA, you know, covering yourself. But they understood you needed permission to do this. It wasn't simply, oh, he's wounded, let's get on, let's, let's get in there and fix this. <clears throat> so after you assess the wound, need to treat it. And there are five general me measures involved. Um, 
Here's a doctor, by the way, doing cataract surgery or a, a surgeon. Um, so the five general measures, clear the wound of foreign matter, get all the, get whatever's in there out, bring together the separated surfaces of the wound, restore the normal conformation, whether you're doing that through simple bandaging, through sutures or cauterization, preserve the normal tissues with medication. So you wanna prevent you want to prevent just swelling. You want to prevent um, those sort of things. You want things to try and come back to, to as normal as possible. And you treat complications as they arise, pain, abscesses, fevers, etc. cetera. Um, the first time I taught this class, I had uh, Master Galen of Occam sit in, and he's a flight surgeon from NASA um, in, in mundane life. And I said, how do these, I just asked him, how do these apply to modern surgery? And he said, really, the only thing that's different is now we know to look out for the complications and plan for them ahead of time and try to head them off. But other than that, these are still the principles of wound treatment in the 21st century. <clears throat> so some of these me measures were conventional, um, even if they seem extreme by our thoughts. Um, in the Chronicle of the Deeds of Don Pero Nino from about 1440, um, it's the, it's a, uh, the Chronicles of the Deeds of Don Pera Nino are kind of 15th century fanfic about a really, really nasty knight and pirate and bandit. Um, and it's a rather inflated account, <clears throat> but it talks about how he was wounded in the leg while he was fighting Moors down in uh, Morocco. Um, and was unable to avail himself of a proper surgery for over a month and his injury in his leg became badly infected. And he goes to Sevilla uh, to get it treated. And the best surgeons there say, we're gonna have to cut the foot off. It's the only way we're gonna save your life, but he refuses. So the only thing they've got left to do is to try and cauterize the wound. Cauterization, brutally painful, but it does have the effect of oftentimes purging infection. Um, so the surgeon, because Don Pero Nino is in fact a very violent badass, is afraid to put the hot irons on Don Pero. So in the, uh, in the uh, chronicle of his life, he takes the hot irons himself and applies them twice to the wound. And after that, it's dressed and healed. And while I'm sure this is exaggerated a bit to make him seem very, very fierce and warlike, the fact is cauterization worked. It was painful. It was brutal, brutal, but it did, um, in fact, work. And it was a very common treatment for wounds. Uh, we run into problems with it once we get into the age of gunshot wounds, but that's a different class. <laughs> More radical method. I love talking about this one. People love to know about the medical crossbow. <laughs> So in the early 14th century, a Dutch surgeon named Jan Eperman uh, illustrated this method for using a crossbow to extract arrows and other objects deeply embedded in the body. Um, and it makes a whole lot of sense when you think about it. A crossbow was probably, in fact, I would say it almost certainly was the best tool at hand to store a massive amount of mechanical injury in a very portable manner. So in this particular case, you've got this, this arrow through this guy's leg illustrated here, and you've got this lock that you put onto the arrow and then onto the string of the bow, you cock the bow, you loose it, and it yanks it out. Again, probably rather painful, but it gets the job done and it gets the foreign object out of the wound so that you can go ahead and start with the healing process. Uh, the first time I was showing this class off, um, I was showing it to uh, my friend, Master Godwin from, Bjorn from Bjornsborg, who's a Smith. Um, and he took one look at that and I said, oh yeah, Dutch locksmiths to use that to yank locks out of doors. So same principle, use the tools you have, use the best tool for the job. And I find, find this fascinating. Complications could arise. Guy insists throughout uh, Curia Magna on strict cleanliness and using wine and vinegar, but you're still working in septic conditions, particularly during warfare. <coughs> Managing and pain and infection were major con considerations. 
Anesthetics in form of poppy juice were recommended. Uh, fevers were fought with many medications derived from herbs, fruits, vegetables, and honeys. Remember, I mentioned there's a lengthy antidotary in the back of this book that's largely mixing various cures and medications that many of them are perfectly valid um, for reducing fever, that sort of thing. They're not as good as antibiotics, of course, but they're right up there with the medicine that was available even into the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, medical honey, you might remember I mentioned honey at the beginning of this class. This is actually the subject that got me started down the rabbit hole that has led me um, to, to where I am with this fascination. So um, a historian um, at University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Alana Krug, um, <coughs> special, special, her specialty is actually uh, medieval military logistics. So reading a lot of uh, exchequer accounts and that sort of thing. And she was looking at exchequer accounts from the Hundred Years War period and noticed that honey was important to have on hand. But there were some interesting things about the um, quantities involved. They were not large, not significantly large, not as large as you would need to feed a garrison or to make mead for a garrison. Um, they tended to be in terms of, you know, maybe the, the garrison had 60 pounds, which 60 pounds of honey sounds like, okay, that's a big chunk. It's not much, not particularly if you've got several hundred soldiers in the area. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, it wasn't ordered on a regular basis from stocks like a lot of other supplies were. It seemed to be ordered as it ran out. So she started uh, investigating and learned some of the properties of honey. Um, and in her uh, paper, soon to be a book, I'm told, The Wounded Soldier, Honey, and Late Medieval Medicine, she theorizes these stocks were for medical use. And there's some definite uh, persuasive arguments to be made for this. Honey doesn't spoil. It's naturally antiseptic. It's also sticky. So if you put honey on a, ble on a, a bleeding cut, it will gum up the works <coughs> and stop the bleeding and disinfect at the same time. Also, when you go into the manuals, de Choliac and other medieval surgeons oftentimes are recommending honey to promote healing and minimize scarring. So um, I actually heard Dr. Krug on uh, the medieval podcast talking about that, and that's what kind of got me interested, and I started digging and finding things, and that's where I got interested about this. Um, <coughs> so... Last thing here I'm gonna wrap up with, um, the depth of six inches. <clears throat> this story really kind of illustrates a lot of these points in one handy anecdote, uh, which we do have a very good um, record of. Um, in 1403, the Prince of Wales, Henry of Monmouth, the future Henry V, was severely wounded at the Battle of Shrewsbury. He was 16 years old and he took an arrow in the face. Um, his treatment was and recovery is recorded by the Royal Surgeon uh, John Bradmore in his uh, Philomena. And it really shows the sophistication of the medieval surgeon and his treatments. So let's talk about this particular patient since it is so well documented. So, <coughs> Um, the prince was struck by an arrow alongside his nose. And um, this is a reproduction of a skull with an arrow in it. And I will tell you, I have flipped this picture from what you would see if you actually went to, I think it's Shrewsbury where this is on display. Um, because um, Bradmore says he was shot on the left side of to the left of his nose. The difficulty with that is the only portraits we have of Henry show him viewed from the left and there is no scar there and we never see him in three quarter or anything else. So there's a fair bit of thought that that Bradmore meant his left looking at the prince. So he was struck by an arrow alongside his nose. Bradmore was actually in London at the time. He was Henry IV's royal surgeon. <clears throat> 
Um, so he had to be dispatched to Wales. During that time, other surgeons attempted to extract the arrow. They were able to remove the shaft, but the arrowhead popped loose. The arrowhead was lodged in the posterior part of his skull at a depth of six inches. So you've got the Prince of Wales, heir to the throne, 16 years old, doubtlessly in excruciating pain, even if they are giving him opiates or something to try and kill it. Um, you've got risks of infection and everything else. And you have basically an inch long, inch and a half long piece of sharp metal lodged in on the inside of his skull, six inches down. What do you do? Well, if you're John Bradmore, you do a work of surgical genius. <clears throat> and the first thing he did was in order to com combat swelling and keep the wound open, Bradmore took wooden dowels and wrapped them in clean linen, again, cleanliness, and dipped them in honey. There's our honey. And he put them into the wound. And over the course of days, he made the dowels wider and wider and, and longer and longer so that, because swelling had already begun to basically open up the wound. This is done even in medicine today. Um, when I was kind of workshopping this class, one of the people um, I, I uh, showed it to is a, an ER nurse. And she said, yes, they use medical dilators even today to open wounds and keep wounds open for, for care. So he essentially expanded the wound. After several days, and Bradmore isn't precise on this point, but I'm thinking it would take him at least a week, the wound was sufficiently open for him to operate. Now, while that was going on, he was busy. <laughs> he designed and commissioned a brand new medical device. He literally invented something for this, which again shows this guy was smart, he, he understood mechanical principles. He understood medical principles. One of the things that I try to always teach when I'm talking about people in the Middle Ages is they weren't dumb. They weren't unsophisticated. They oftentimes didn't have the same education we have, but they were just as smart as we were. Bradmore designed this extractor and had it built. He was at a royal castle. He had access to armors. This is a reproduction of one. <coughs> So this consists of a set of tongs, three tongs, that are about the width of an arrow shaft with this screw down the center. So he could feed it in, and then once it got down inside the socket of the arrowhead, he could then turn the screw to expand the prongs inside it so that they would wedge hard against the inside of the arrowhead, and then he could pull it out. And that is precisely what he did. Now you've got the Prince of Wales with a six inch deep, probably one inch wide hole in his face. What do you do about that? Now you've, you've got the aftercare. It's one thing to get the wound out. That's only part of treating the injury. So now he needed to fight infection and promote healing. So the first thing he did was he irrigated the wound with wine. Again, he may not understand germ theory, but he understood wine cleaned wounds. Then he began reversing the process, did the same thing with the dilators backwards. He had the dowels in there with the linen soaked in a medicine made of uh, boiled breadcrumbs and barley flour and honey. Um, in one of these classes, someone pointed out boiled breadcrumbs could have theoretically you know, been moldy and had rudimentary penicillin. I'm not going to make that sort of leap but it was believed that boiled breadcrumbs and barley flour were necessary for healing. Great, and healing was there again. It took 20 days for him to close up the wound, changing out the dowels, replacing them with smaller ones, so it healed from the inside out, <clears throat> until finally he was at a point where he could treat the outer skin with an ointment made from rosin and gums, which is the same as if you go to the ER now with a, with a cut, and instead of stitches, they glue it closed. He basically used medieval super glue. And uh, this illustration I've got here is from the generally terrible Netflix movie, The King. But I did like the fact that they did give Henry a scar on his cheek, um, at least. One of the few things they may have done right in that film. So anyway, um, that kind of brings us to our wrap up point.
Um, just, um, you know, contrary to popular portrayals, the medieval surgeon was often highly skilled and well read. Um, medieval surgeons performed complicated procedures and codified their methods. <coughs> And granted, their success was limited by our modern standards, but still remarkable in their efficacy. And um, I think um, John has um, a or has a copy of this avail presentation available. If you want it, it does have a list of further readings. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and stop the screen share and come back to this and. It looks like we've got eh, about 15 minutes if anyone's got any questions, comments, thoughts. Yeah, those towards uh, the leech of, of Calentir. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we're dealing with modern in modern medicine is, is wound care. And it's mm -hmm. become very much a specialty in and of itself, though it hasn't created a true college of wound care. There is one in the process, I believe. Uh, currently and modernly, we are using honey as dressings. They, you can go down to the local pharmacy uh, and pick up honey impregnated dressings. These things are very effective for dealing with chronic and long-term wounds. Um, as a physician, I've had the opportunity to use those, particularly in nursing homes with these uh, decubitus ulcers, uh, bed sores, if you will. Mm -hmm. and some of these are quite, quite deep mm -hmm. uh, to the bone, in all honesty. And healing from those, one can only hope for granulation below uh, of the wound and healing from inside out. Uh, and the honey does a good job of, of producing that. It holds moisture in, it holds the nutrients in. It does provide an antisepsis, uh, to some extent, almost antibacterial. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, again, it becomes a barrier to other, other infections. And uh, quite frankly, it's, it's been quite remarkable in helping heal some of these really long-term and nasty wounds. Uh, I'm sure they were quite aware of this and dealt with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it's interesting about the dilation in the process of removing that arrowhead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's what kind of dragged me down the rabbit hole. It's funny. I, I, I freely admit I am terribly squeamish, but I'm fascinated by process and I'm fascinated by <clears throat> innovative problem solving. Yep. yep. And that one definitely uh, grabbed me. That's what yep. kind of started me down, you know, digging yeah, it's down this. Oh, I'm sorry. It's amazing the amount of pain tolerance that people would have and deal with simply on the basis of having to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine they kept this young man fairly drunk as well as fairly doped up on, on poppy juice. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. One of the interesting things, and I, I should have mentioned this, is that, you know, if you, if you know your Shakespeare, you know that, you know, Henry V, part of his story is he starts off as this wild, uh, reckless party boy, and then he gets very, very serious. And that has some ties actually to his his historical life. He basically became very devout, very religious, and and very serious. Yeah, you know, by the time he was king, and there's some thought that this wound may have been part of that that he's you know suffered from PTSD from it. The other interesting thing about it is that on the Agincourt campaign, Henry had 23 surgeons in his um, train as part of his entourage. And these surgeons were not just for the nobles, not just for the royal house, not just for the knights, they were for the army. So he, he clearly knew the value of surgeons firsthand and employed them. Um, I'm seeing Aubrey has a hand up. Yeah, I was just gonna say that a lot of um, herbal remedies include honey in them. Yes, they do. Absolutely. And I will admit that I have not gotten much into the medicine side of this. I'm mostly interested in kind of the nuts and bolts of the, uh, the surgical processes. Um, <coughs> but um, yeah, absolutely. And when I'm looking at Guy's, um, you know, antidotary, which in English translation, you know, starts on page 567 and runs until page 637. You know, he has a rather thorough listing of various medications and such. <clears throat> 
Yeah, honey really is great. I mean, treating sore throats with hot water and honey. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and um, I, you know, you can find references to honey, you know, all the way back into Galen, back into Aristotle, back into antiquity, honestly. So I do believe it was fairly commonly well known, you know, on some level. Um, And I'm looking, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to Dr. Krug's book when it comes out. I haven't heard anything new on it, but with COVID, who knows what's going on in the state of publishing. All right. Well, Jahan, I think we may be at a stopping point here. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.